Hello, my name is David Mecklenburg, and I'm one of the Trinity authors. Um, the story I'm going to read is from the January edition called A Pearl of Loneliness. It might help at this point to kind of read the prompt that I worked off of, um, which begins. The night was bleak and biting, like, the on like only the middle of winter can be, and the sky cluttered with stars was wide and cloudless. It was as if the moment was frozen, preserved for posterity by some unseen and all-powerful force that knew what was to come. So this is a pearl of loneliness. I was surprised at the breadth of my loneliness, how small I was in it. Perhaps that of the school break, which was an outward manifestation of my loneliness, and this place explained why I found myself standing before an empty classroom. I had lost track of the days. The empty seats, the dull computer screens, and clear whiteboards explained that I had come on a day when there was no school. A quick glance at the school calendar said everything. My deliberate rituals of loneliness had erased even the Society of Holiday Observance. Outside, the sun was shining. A matarasu dressed herself in the tearing shrouds of gray veils of ice silk that came fluttering like pennants of desolate victory winged, hungry, oblivious to the fragility of skin, membrane, and tissue. I had wanted my loneliness to be far away. You don't just choose a 14-hour flight, after all, especially when you were a little over six feet tall and poor. The overwhelming loneliness of a titanic city was too much. I wanted to savor my loneliness, even though I didn't tell anyone that, including myself. Instinctively, I knew there was a difference between being lonely among millions versus just hundreds. I chose Hokkaido and a remote fishing town over Tokyo. Like any meal, a feast of loneliness should have a temporal frame, a succession of courses. Seasons would do in my case. The old romance of fall, of crisp, cooling air, and fire-red maples was a good season to fall in love with solitude. Spring, with the ephemeral classicism of Sakura and the rebirth, would then be a good season to raise my spirits. And that leaves winter, famous for its discontent and darkness, the snowy crown of my isolation. I was 27. Age is just a number is a phrase that I hated even then. The sentiment, sentiment is innocuous enough, but there is something primarily glib about the tautology. Understand that by January, the 27-year-old me had found my loneliness and the piercing cold of the Shirotoku Peninsula welcoming me with its abundance. My days there were simple, a treasure of my existence. My breakfast consisted of fish cake, miso soup, and rice warmed up on an old kerosene stove, after which I would wrap myself in my costume, for it felt like one, and walk to work. I wore a toque against the cold, a thickly woven thing of black wool so long that you could not tell where my hair ended, and the toque began. Bundled further with a scarf, a down coat, a wool fisherman's sweater, and long underwear, I enjoyed the closeness of the cold as I walked along the beach towards town. Much of what I found along the shore found its way into my simple rooms where I lived. The original owners had willed the house to the school for the purpose of exchange teacher accommodation. But it was far too big for that, so most of it was shuttered off. And no, it wasn't a romantic home of sliding shoji screens and ingeniously joined wood. It had been built in a western style during the 50s, but its cinder blocks reminded me of a castle stonework and I decorated parts of it with pieces of glass, wood, stone, and small, dried sea creatures. The village remained sleepy throughout the season because there was not much work to be done in winter, save wait, although a few women tended the few remaining drying racks of Bonito. They eyed me from a distance, but I had grown used to it, considering it like a subtle depth of kombu in the soup of my loneliness. The old ways were disappearing, perhaps growing lonely themselves, for every year the night encroached further as the young people left and never came back. Even then I knew that I facilitated this migration by helping the very young ones to learn English. Although I cannot be sure it worked, most times I felt like some fantastic talking gaijin scarecrow, six foot one, waving my arms, 
and chortling my simple words. I knew my voice was pitched far too low for a woman in Japan, and when I compensated, the result sounded like the cacophonic honking of an adolescent boy. The children loved me because I ate their food gifts, which the previous teachers didn't, and my funny voice. The young mothers didn't mind me too much since I was so outlandish. Some of the men perhaps developed consideration, but these were brushed away like the morning cobwebs of last night's sake and beer. They would finish their cigarettes and get back to mending some net or engine and wait for the summer. Seiji, who was the best motorcycle mechanic in town, liked me, I think. He was the friendliest and handsome in a rough cut way, but I retreated away from him like a crab scuttling black into its burrow. By January, I understood my deliberate mistake to place myself among children and even one cute guy in a place where I could not speak. The silence began in Marseille the previous summer. The doctor had a fair degree of sang-froid, which I always thought was a mythic stereotype. This happens, he said in calm, existential English. The outward symptoms are not serious enough at first. We did not arrest it in time. You could not know. You will be fine, but I am afraid you cannot have children. So now you know why I was alone. I told myself that being alone was a special privilege, especially in such an essentially crowded country, but I did not see it that way, could not see it that way for a long time. I simply knew that I would never have children of my own. The thought of being with yet another man, intimacy was repugnant to me, but I cut off the repugnance with categorical judgments. It was easier that way because it included the gross foul ones and the nice ones like Seiji. No man will want me now. It did not matter. Men did not matter. I was more than an object to impregnate and leave, or worse, I would have been tied down to a limbo of domesticity that eroded the last vestiges of myself. These lessons were rote, but they worked. At night, the winds came screaming down from Alaska, and I learned to shuffle home quickly. I batten the shutters, leaving enough air open so the kerosene heater didn't kill me, and I would then wrap myself in duvet upon duvet and listen to the winds carry out their barometric wrath. Trees got uprooted, boats washed away, a dog drowned, and Seiji even said that a bear woke up, and that was never good. Sometimes the winds played, waxed playfully. They scattered fishing buoys and left decks of playing cards out in neat games of scat and euchre. Thousands of pineapples swam ashore from a shattered shipping container once. The winds were a kind of company, and I grew resentful of them. They tugged on my sleeve, they frotted me in my commute, tore at me in the evening. Sometimes there were faint winds carrying the voices of those not only lost, but who were never seen again, those who disappeared into the ocean or the earth during moments so banal that farewells were not exchanged. This made the faint winds the most plaintive of all. But sometimes there were the clearest, coldest nights when blankets of clouds had moved to the west and there were only the ghosts of the winds. I remember that one day I was alone at school because it began like every other day, but turned on the absence of the children and left me alone in the town. Leaving school, I wandered, not exploring, for I knew every inch of the place by then. Everything was closed. This was the pearl of loneliness blanketed in the cold, briny solitude of winter. The new year had barely begun. My new life has just begun. I walked outside and whispered this to the ocean, but the ocean, whose conceptions of cycles and time are much vaster and different than ours, simply maintained its fractal surf chant. What had I learned? Is this the abyss that looks into you? Is this sublimity? I could not decide, although I knew the sea was holy. There was a Tory gate built out on the water, demarcating the transition from mundane to inscrutable. I briefly stopped to look at it, through it, while the air smelled of kelp, diesel oil, and the general tide of rotting things. I made my way back to the house, made ramen with an egg and some pork, the radio worked, at least, and so we listened to a list competition among young players in Sapporo. I began to cry, but somehow the repetition of the performances, so many Hungarian rhapsodies, saved me from the afternoon demons of regret, and I fell asleep. When I awoke, it was dark again, and I was hungry. I ate some rice and bran pickled radishes and wondered what to do. The radio had switched to a man's voice. He had a beautiful, deep, smoky voice and he was explaining something to a female interviewer whom I immediately disliked. I caught only snippets, but it had something to do with repairing windmills. It was lonely work, he said, and that much I understood. The interviewer then came back on in 
the hyper-feminine squeal that so many women affect to obduracy in Japan, and I switched off the radio. It was then I noticed it. Absolute quiet. No, not quite absolute, for I became aware of my breath, the blood in my ears, as though the house itself was a giant shell on the beach and I was inside of it. I got wrapped up in my warmest clothes and went outside. It was bright. The starlight suffused the clean, dark air enough for me to see the gentle surf, the flat obsidian of the ocean, and the clumps of debris strewn upon the sand. In the distance where it was, where it always was, halfway between heaven and earth, my fleeting home of the town was the Tory Gate, the dynamic in its stasis, a portico to elsewhere. A large rock on the beach faced the gate, and I sat down. It had been worn smooth by countless people doing what I was doing. Even though my gloved, even through my gloved hand, I could feel no barnacles or rough fissures. I sighed. I wondered what was I going to do be in my life now that everything would be different. But gradually, my mind diffused its scattered thoughts as I watched the blank blackness framed in the Tory. That is when they began to come from the sea. Change needs time. Perhaps that is why I did not notice them in any familiar wakefulness. One by one, the stars reached down and were one with their inflections in the flat, cold ocean and moved toward me. The children arrived first at the beach, incredibly delicate lanterns made of paper, bloodless skin, cherry petals, and the orange light of summer sunsets before fireworks and wonder. There was a girl. She was tall and strong like her mother, but fearless. A kinetic artist, she walked along fences until she fell off and cut open her knees, but she climbed back up, like a white rose that cut itself upon its own thorns. There was a boy, naked beneath the starlight, then a baseball uniform and the summer kiss of dandelions. Books, their homework, dirty clothes, there was laughter on the beach and the setting sun. I knew the place. It was Point Reyes in California. And so I worried about the undertow. When I closed my eyes, I breathed in their smell at night when they had first fallen asleep. A man made of deeply illuminated opal stepped out of the surf, flecks of jasper in his hair. He was a beautiful young man, an older man of perfect middle age, and an elder man stooped slightly and shrunk by the gravity of a healthy life. The sparkle of the starlight never left him, and he grew stronger as he made houses, stories, toy boats, and modest overtures for love and music. Together, we jumped naked into a waterfall in the uncertainty that it fell into. There were oceans of Sundays and boredom and blank walls in hospitals that called for looking and for hope and for despair to remain away just that much more. We both shared the work of infrequent infidelities, but both of us had the gift of selective memories. I remembered how he held my hand in the car driving back from Point Reyes and how the children slept behind us. He was fond of the Foo Fighters, and Everlong was playing on the stereo. I watched them appear on the beach. Sometimes they were solitary, and at others a group of figures. The ages of the children and the man ranged over many years, and then I noticed that they were not all the same children nor the same man. But like distant lightning on the peaks of mountains in the darkness, I knew their shape and being, but not their detail. Eventually the tide came in, as if to gather them, and the stars seemed to shine brighter. One by one, they began to disappear, walking out into the night in the ocean. Out beyond the Tory Gate, they would flash momentarily in their lights of pink, carmine, and peach, and then flutter out like candles knocked over in a cave. Later, when the last lantern had winked out in the ocean, I returned to my home, walking through the profound, cold darkness. The tide continued to rise in convex sibilance, but I was back at the house soon enough. I felt graceful for even its faint relative warmth, but I found sand. I shook out my clothing and my hair. It was in my socks and my sweater. I could feel it between my fingers and itching me in the small of my back. It was the sand they brought. I burned up a good deal of kerosene warming water for a bath, which I took with determination but not much luxury, and I still felt the sand. I drank a tumbler of sake, and it did, toward the end, help me fall toward sleep. But I felt grains of sand at my elbow. There were some in the scaffa curve of my ear upon the pillow. Sand itched against my ankles. Then I remembered. I was living on a lonely beach, and the sand was everywhere. 
They were everywhere. I was never going to escape, and I understood why the oyster grows a pearl. Um, no. So that story is about Ada. Ada is the primary narrative voice that you're going to read a lot of in um, Trinity. I can say that almost all the stories are through her voice, although they're not always about her, but mostly. Some of the stories are like this one, kind of based within this world. Some of them aren't, and you'll see that as you go through. Ada has a definite biography. And if you want to read a um, sort of fictionalized memoir that she wrote about how she wound up childless, you can read The Nightingale Stone, which is also published by Blue Forge Press. Um, in this case, this, in my mind, took place when uh, a misadventure had occurred in Europe. And she had wanted to do something, and she had to get away, so she went to Japan to work as a, um, you know, exchange teacher. And part of that is actually based on a story, and in homage to really a story by a British writer named Angela Carter. Now, Angela Carter wrote a story called The Smile of Winter. You can find it in a collection of stories called Fireworks. Carter's probably best known for The Bloody Chamber, which I think still probably gets taught in um, gender studies classes and literature. It's an amazing book. Fireworks is actually the one I prefer the most because it involves some nonfiction and some fiction. She has this beautiful story uh, about living in a similar place in Japan and several others that take place there. And so that kind of drew its inspiration for me. That's where I sort of, when I read that first prompt, it's like, oh, that's the, that Ada gets to write her Angela Carter story now. So that's where that kind of story came from. It was a good one to write. It was an excellent one, I think, to start this off with because it was in January, which is New Year's in Japan, which is the big holiday there. And I just had this original image of her walking into the schoolroom and noticing, like, oh, everybody's gone because she's been sort of so preoccupied with her life that she just lost track of the days. At any rate, that was the story for that. And um, is it my favorite? No, not quite. I like it. But I think there's some other great ones that are coming up. And you can learn certainly much more about Ada and her biography uh, if you continue to look through Trilogy and subscribe to it. Um, or if you've read some of the other ones as well. So I do like to kind of finish off by saying Ada's story doesn't end there on a beach in Japan. Um, it does carry on and uh, continues to do so. So it's been a very big pleasure to write every month for this collection. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I uh, usually kind of hear, I can almost hear Ada telling me these stories when it comes. And so with every prompt, she has some sort of different story to tell. Like I said, some of them take place in this world. Some of them, one in Sacramento, one in Joshua Tree. Um, there's one in uh, Los Angeles. And there's some others that don't occur necessarily within this world. So I look forward to uh, hopefully reading a few more of these. And I hope you enjoy reading it. I hope you enjoy the reading and of the other readings that the other authors of Trinity are going to be doing in this collection. So thank you for coming with us this far and stick with us. Thank you.